Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, my talk is not going to focus on one study in particular. I was thinking I'm more going to give an overview of some of the research that we have been doing, um, Yeah, rather than looking at a specific topic, because we do various work from um, things that's more on coastal impacts and coastal vulnerability towards, and then a lot of numerical modeling. So I'll touch a bit on that. Um, actually, the, the talks that, that's already been presented this morning was a perfect introduction to my talk. Um, and I'll touch on, on some of the topics as well. Okay, so first of all, um, I'll try speaking into the microphone while looking there as well. Maybe I should just look here. So uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction into what is what do we mean with with coastal vulnerability. Um, I'm going to have a we're going to look have a quick look at um, climate change effects on the coastal domain. Um, what is the specific consequences on the coast? Like Neville mentioned, it can be quite severe, and I think this is one of the areas um, where we really see the impacts of climate change. Um, slight, slight changes in climate change has, has a dramatic effect on the coast. Um, then, of course, what can we do to maybe slow down these changes in the climate on the coast, uh, adaptation measures, and then also look at some of the um, technological interventions and monitoring systems that we're busy developing and have developed. Okay, so uh, this is just a quick um, slide to show some of our, our field visits and, and things like that and to give scale to some of the problems. Um, I'm not sure if a few guys have been to some of the built environment talks, um, but we work very close with other CSR groups, including built environment, and there you can just see the scale of some of these coastal armor, armoring units. Okay, so severe weather conditions, what are the implications on the coastal domain? Well, mainly um, potential delays at ports, um, impacts on towing operations, and this is of, of great importance because if we have delays in ports and towing operations, it's got a direct financial implication. Um, impact on coastal infrastructure, like you can see in those pictures, um, also financial um, implications and even um, livelihood and safety issues for, for coastal populations. Um, the, the present problems that we're experiencing due to climate change may increase and worsen. Um, and of course, the main thing is we need to quantify this, like how much change can we expect over the next 50 or 100 years. Okay, so climate change. Um, some people think that the, the clothing that people use to go to the coastal domain is a proof of global warming. Um, like you can see on the top right hand side there. I'm not that sure, but I mean, who can <laughs> argue with evidence like that? Um, other evidence also suggests that um, we, we are seeing an approximate 3.3 millimeter increase in, in still sea level, sea level water rise um, per year, um, plus minus 0 0.4 millimeters per year. Um, as you can see in this graph in the bottom, this is, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, um, but it's pretty much based on, on data that we have been recording. And then, of course, like I mentioned in the previous talks, when we're looking into the future, there's, there's uncertainty associated with it. Um, some studies suggest um, sea level, um, still sea level um, level rise of 0 0.5 meters to 2 meters. Um, but there's a, a you know, and all of these projections are based on physical processes. So. Um, in our studies, usually we, we do scenario studies where we say, okay, least case scenario and worst case scenario. Okay, so what are some of the consequences on the coast? Um, some of the important potential consequences are um, changes in the local ocean wind and wave climate regimes. Um, this has got to do with direct wave impact on our coastal infrastructure and things like that. Um, extreme inshore seawater levels. Um, this is this is related to coastal flooding and inundation. Um, yeah, coastal erosion and underscoring this is also coastal infrastructure like breakwaters protecting harbors, um, complexities and thresholds and non-linearities. Um, for example, sand transport. And this kind of connects very well to what Francois was just saying about the, the atmospheric changes over Africa. Um, for example, a small change in the atmospherics in the, in the magnitude of the wind fields that we see over the ocean and coastal domain can have an influence on bigger waves that, that reach the coast. So, so, for instance, a small increase in, in wind magnitude, velocity, 
um, can have like a 10% increase in significant wave height, which can have like a 150% increase in sediment transport, um, depending on your coastal system. And this is, of course, directly linked to coastal erosion. Um, and then, of course, the, the worst thing of it all is the combination of all the extreme events. Um, you, you might ask yourself or think by yourself, yeah, what is the odds of having a spring high tide and a storm and all of these scenarios at the same time? Um, well, these days in the Strand, in the Western Cape, every, almost every winter we're having overtopping of the seawalls there, um, of the waves actually breaking in the, in the streets of Strand. So it happens more often that you, than you would think. Um, uh, okay, so the southern Western Indian Ocean coastal zone is very vulnerable to climate change impacts. And one of, a few of the reasons are um, vast low-lying areas. This isn't that clear, but I showed a picture of Mozambique. Um, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll show a case study of Mozambique a bit later as well. Um, and um, our, we've, our, we've, we don't really have that ability to adapt and, and protect our coastline for climate change due to poverty and, and, and lack of knowledge and things like that. And that's all the type of things that we have to um, take account for in our management strategies. Okay, so the point is to try and prevent these type of pictures that I'm showing here. This is actually strand that I spoke of earlier. And um, this is almost every year now that this is happening. Um, the reason behind that is a, it's a different long story, but it's basically because the the protective dune system that should be there to, that protects the coastal zone has been, has been removed and the road has been built in its stead. Um, yeah. Okay, so vulnerability and risk of coastal zones. This is just a summary of, of the things that I've been talking about thus far. Um, basically, a, a thought process that we have to go through, um, assessing what, is, what are the primary hazards to, to our physical coastal infrastructure, which is direct wave impacts, coastal flooding, inundation, erosion, and underscoring. Um, and then look at what, what are the, the hazards or the vulnerabilities that we're facing here. Um, these include the elevation, like in Mozambique, it's low, vast, low-lying areas with dense populations. Um, the distance of the infrastructure or, or the settlements from the, the physical coastline. Um, exposure to waves, erosion. Um, very important is the underlying um, geo geology and geomorphology. So how erodible is your coastline? Um, anthropogenic actions affecting stability of sediment supply. For example, if dunes aren't managed or rehabilitated. Um, uh, sea level rise, erosion, and, and um, the slope of the coastline. All of this has got as influences on the amount of energy that actually reaches the coastline. Um, the drivers of change is climate change, land transformations, um, demographics are how densely populated the area. Um, this then, the vulnerability is the result of coastal vulnerability, and then we have to look at what is the intervention measures. Um, for example, setback lines. Now, a setback line, can I just, see I'm gonna trip here. Um, a setback line is basically a management line beyond which coastal development should really not be allowed in the future. Um, and why we kind of sometimes call it management lines is because a lot of development tend to be in front of this line already. And then it kind of becomes a political and management issue of how to, to mitigate this situation. Here is an example of Mossel Bay um, where we've mapped the vulnerability. Um, you'll see the different things that I've just mentioned in the previous slide, like elevation, distance to infrastructure. Each one of these parameters were analyzed per section of this coastline. Um, and a weighting factor was added to that. So you'll see for the same coastal domain, um, or the same coastal domain might be very vulnerable in one aspect, but very resilient in another aspect. Um, and then using weighting factors, we then tally them all together and we get a total picture of the coastal vulnerability. And these type of maps are very useful for coastal, uh, yeah, the governing authorities or municipalities to decide on where to put their, um, focus their, their attention first. Um, this is just an example of another, this is actually a subpart of a big study that we've done for Department of Environmental Affairs, where we do these scenarios of looking at the one and 10 year residual um, seawater levels, plus 
either zero um, sea level rise or a sea level rise scenario. And you can see as we're adding the different parameters of um, sea level rise, the, the seawater level surge or residual becomes much higher, especially on the southern coast. Um, and in these scenarios, we count up all the different aspects that add to the, to the coastal flooding elevations. Um, usually, a lot of studies don't take into account the erosion that is associated with sea level rise. Um, using simple engineering principles, so like for example the Bruins rule, you can calculate how the coastal profile will actually adapt with a new still seawater level. So, and as an example of this, this is, a, this is Bloberg Strand close to Cape Town. And the green line, you can see, uh, you know, the text is very small, sorry about that, but it's basically a one in 10 year, one in 20 year run up scenario um, without taking coastal erosion into account that's associated with the sea level rise. Um, but when you take into account the, the sea level rise um, Okay, sorry. So it's it's the green line is the one up one in twenty year um, run up scenario plus a zero point five meter sea level rise, but without taking the coastal erosion into account. When you take the coastal erosion profile changes into account, you get the black line, which you can see is actually quite a big difference um, and making making the coast even more vulnerable. This is another example of Richards Bay. Um, so in the previous picture that I showed, we used numerical models to force our wave climates, and that's how we, how we got the information into the engineering, let's say, equations to determine the, the profile change. Um, another aspect that, or another method that you can use is using simple one-dimensional modeling, mathematical modeling, um, and this is an example of, of such a study. In this study, it, it, uh, the, the important factor was the, the bypassing rate that Richards Bay Municipality implements. In certain embayments or port harbors, you have to bypass sediment because the we built breakwaters basically that interrupted this river of sand traversing up the coast. Now, if through management reasons or other reasons we do not um, bypass enough sediment, we can have really insane amounts of erosion. And this is what this picture is indicating. If the, amount, the correct amount of sediment is not bypassed, um, Worst case scenario, you can get the red line, can be our new coastline within 50 years. Uh, this is an example, a Mozambican example of mapping areas of vulnerability with, to sea level rise, erosion, um, and all the other factors that I spoke of before. And the, fact, the point that I wanted to make clear here is in Mozambique, you can see how densely populated the areas that are in front of the setback lines. So what can we do about um, all of these threats threatening the coastal domain? Um, well, the biggest thing is we have to have a no regret adaptation measure. So f like this example, I'm pretty much sure they're regretting what they've done. Um, they might have protected a bit, but they're <laughs> yeah, at least one part of the house is probably going to fall into the ocean. Um, so adaptation does not need to be um, very much out there with super hard engineering and big structures, like this picture indicating just um, elevating coastal infrastructure is already uh, a good adaptation measure. Uh, Southern African states have very little uh, adaptive capability, like mentioned before in the previous presentations. The ability to halt coastal impacts on a large scale um, is virtually non-existent. Adaptation would reduce impacts by a fa factor from 10 to 100. Of course, this is just a, a figure, but the, the idea behind it is that the costs compared to uh, the cost of, of creating adaptation measures are minor compared to um, the recovery or the rebuild of, of coastal infrastructures. Um, and, the, and the main message for governing authorities and municipalities is um, implement uh, is sooner rather than later. Don't wait until some things start falling into the ocean to, before you take action. Um, okay. So a conservative and a precautionary principle is al always a good way to go. Um, and uh, authorities have to be proactive to protect lives, livelihoods, and infrastructures. Uh, prevention is better than cure. 
Uh, sustainable solutions, we don't want uh, solutions that take a lot of work and then implies a lot of costs and be a, being a burden to municipalities and governing authorities either. So here's a, a simple diagram to kind of illustrate some of the options that we do have when it comes to mitigation measures. Um, so for example, that red line is, is the reference line that we're working with at the moment then the adaptive responses that we can take are or either we just leave our infrastructure where it is without any adaptation measure and kind of deal with the fact that we're probably going to lose whatever we're looking at, in this case a, a lighthouse. Um, we can intervene with protection measures. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the protection measures um, that's available. Beach nourishment, I'm personally kind of very much for that type of intervention, but it's very expensive expensive but again comparing to losing infrastructure um, or retreat and retreat is obviously the best option for when you're developing new coastal um, infrastructure um, here I've got a picture of nature's valley I'm not sure who in the audience have completed the otter hiking trail but this is where the otter hiking trail finishes um, it's a perfect example of where management was done correctly. The development was done behind the four dune system. Um, it's got a perfectly healthy um, four dune system, and, if, and the four dune is the best way of actually protecting coastal um, infrastructure. So I'm not going to go through all the adaptive measures. I kind of want to go get to the technology um, part of the presentation. There's just sea walls and... and um, and, and sand nourishment, dikes, the Dutch are very famous for their dike systems, um, parallel coastal infrastructure either underwater or above water, um, groins and geotextile bags which is very much the flavor of the year <laughs> type of very popular among um, local municipalities for the use for protection of coastal areas. Um, and here is an example again of Mozambique where we've kind of took each location and suggested diff different mitigation options varying from management options to soft engineering to hard engineering um, and, and they can either choose one or the other or combination of, of it. So this is where our research is at its most practical level where, they can, where the local authorities can do something about the problem. Okay, so then to get to the technology solutions, so again, this, is, this links a lot to numerical modeling. Um, I won't go into too much details, but if, if you've got more questions, you can just come and ask me afterwards. This is an example of one of our wave refraction models just outside of Table Bay, um, and you can see the sheltering of Robben Island um, for the wave energy approaching the coastline. Um, we've just completed a project another project for Department of Environmental Affairs where we've, we've made 23 numerical wave models all around the South African coastline. Um, the resolution of these models are on 500 meters and um, yeah so we used all of the each model had input from 17 years of, of uh, recorded and model data um, and with this we were then able to um, sketch all of these climate change and and so severe scenarios for Department of Environmental Affairs, which they're now aiming at um, creating a standardized um, management system for all the provinces and coastal cities. It's actually very forward thinking of the Department of Environmental Affairs. Um, then Coast Cam is another initiative that we're busy with. We're um, putting up cameras all around the coastline of South Africa. Um, and we are doing online processing of these images for, for shoreline management and monitoring so that we can actually detect the movement of the shoreline and from this we can infer where there's hot spots of erosion and how much sediment has actually moved and eroded and things like that. Um, it's also linked with an operational forecasting system that we've um, done, you know, a pilot system that we've run in False Bay. Um, the, the winds generated by Francois model has actually been the input to this, this model um, and fishermen can now SMS a specific location within False Bay and they get a three hourly forecast for the next nine hours on all the oceanographic information like for example the wind strength direction, wave height period direction and um, three-dimensional current information. 
Um, and this was actually, I'm not sure if it's a mode two type of research that Colleen was talking about, but we started this project with community involvement from the beginning. Um, we had a lot of, of workshops with them. That's why we decided on an SMS-based system, not a web-based system or anything that needs a smartphone. And in this process of validating the things, they were part of, of, of the process. So that was good to hear you talk about it this morning as well. Um, okay, and this is my, pretty much, this is my last slide. I just wanted to play this video. So here you can see the, the surface current velocities, that's the colors that you see varying of false pay. And this red lines moving on the graphs here are just the wave parameters per um, situation. And this model, this is the operational model and the information that the fisherman is actually um, accessing via simple SMS. So in the background, the model is super complex and sciencey, but from wh where they see the information, it's, it's digestible. Um, yeah. And you can, we're busy updating WaveNet, which is a already an operational forecasting website that we've got up and running for the wave climate for South Africa. So you can go and have a look if you've got time. Thank you very much.